So it's uh, Azim here from Exponential View, and this is part of our series of conversations about what surprises artificial intelligence will have in store for us in 2025. It's a particularly hard question, of course, because they're surprises. Uh, if we knew what they were, they wouldn't be surprises. Uh, but to uh, help us work through one of those questions, um, I've got Dylan Patel, who is the founder, the boss, the supremo of uh, really my favorite uh, semiconductor data center infrastructure uh, vehicle for analysis, uh, analyzing these questions. Uh, Dylan, thank you for joining us. Yeah, thank you for having me, Azim. I'm, uh, and, you're, and I'm here with Azim, the you know the uh, the leader of of exponents, right? <laughs> well, we try, we try. So I'm in a hotel in uh, in New York, which is explains the slightly bizarre, weird vanilla background. I was here for um, the the Deal Book Summit, uh, Andrew Ross Sorkin and New York Times Deal Book. So I was able to hear uh, Jeff Bezos, Sundar Pichai. Uh, and Sam Altman speak uh, yesterday. Well, also Prince Harry and uh, Serena Williams. Um, a few of them talked about AI, and um, the the thing that that you know really came across. Uh, there was a slightly different message between Sundar and Sam. Sam said, "There is no wall. Things are still going to keep going. There's lots of uh, room to run." And Sundar said the low hanging fruit has been picked um, and it's gonna get a little bit harder from now. And Jeff said, Amazon is really turning its attention and we've just released these new, this new vertical stack of uh, you know, chips and models, new pricing and so on. Um, who was right out of them, do you think? Um, yes, yeah, so I think, I think it's like quite a quite an interesting, right? Like one's just getting started. One saying, "Hey, it's going to be more incremental from here," and one's uh, hype beast. Uh, you know, we're going to keep going uh, exponential from here, right? Uh, I think this this is a sponsored by Smart Water somehow, right? Um, <laughs> it's pretty easy, but, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the the interesting thing is that you also have to think about what is each person's um, motivations for their statements, right? Um, right. You know. Amazon is just getting started, right? Like, you know, if you look back a year ago, they were woefully behind. Um, and today they're still woefully behind, right? Their new models are still like very much not even top five in the world, right? Um, mm -hmm. You know, but as as like the leading cloud company, they should be in that top five, but they're not. Um, you know, you look at you look at OpenAI, their motivations are they must raise, right? Uh, the, the level of scaling that they want, they're going to spend all of the money that they just raised, the 6 billion uh, equity and 4 billion debt you know, in like a year and a half. And, and, you know, they would like to commit to more compute than they are. They, they got with that money. Um, and so they, they need to raise again, like, like in a quarter or right. two, right. Uh, if they want to really get that money and then start like committing to even more compute. Um, and then, and then lastly, you have, um, you have Sundar who, uh, you know, I think, I think they're still in like release paralysis. They've, they've, you know, haven't been able to release their Gemini ultra models in a while, right? They keep releasing pro iterations of the pro, right. they keep inching up, but they haven't released this flagship model yet. Right. Uh, that, that open AI has that Anthropic has, um, you know, and so on and so forth. Right. So they're really, uh, lagging behind on that front. So I think it's interesting that they say it's only incremental from here, given they still haven't even gotten to the top rung of a uh, right. top echelon. So that's, that's a little bit concerning uh, as far as who's right. I think it's, I think it's closer to Sam or uh, Sundar uh, or sorry, Sam or um, Bezos, because we are just getting started in AI, right? Like these, right. these scaling, uh, you know, on, on many different vectors, whether it be uh, synthetic data, whether it be uh, compute, whether it be push training, whether it be reasoning, um, whether it be AI infrastructure and inference rollout, all of this has just started, right? Uh, we're, you, we're nowhere you, close to you, this being as pervasive. Right. And what you've just described, though, reminds me of the Charlie Munger quote, which is, uh, show me the incentive and I'll show you the outcome. And these these three different uh, leaders have got different incentives to give us, give us a particular uh, answer, as you say. Sort of Sam has to exponentiate and continues to do so in order to keep to keep raising. So you say... And I, I, I believe I also agree with that, that we are just getting started, that the it's easy to mistake turbulence on the journey for the plane not getting to its destination. And of course, engineering of new products of these of this scale is bound to hit ro roadblocks. When we talk about exponential growth, right, and we think about what's happening with these AI models, 
Um, there's lots of exponentials going on. There is the amount of data they need, the amount of compute they need, the speed with which they're growing. Uh, whenever we've looked at technologies like this, like in the semiconductors back in the 70s, 80s and 90s, there are often cracks, right? There are moments where it just becomes hard to get around that hurdle. You need a new approach. Where do you think that, at what layer do you think we'll first see a crack in the exponentials that are driving AI? Will it be design, manufacturing, materials, deployment? Yeah, interesting. So you mentioned like uh, glimmers of cracks, right? Like there's obviously one one angle is, hey, models keep getting better, but are they getting better at the pace that uh, people are espousing, right? And so then there's the whole like debate over the last you know couple months of scaling laws slowing down. Uh, the, then there's also the flip side is um, cracks around deployment. And that's where actually there's a lot of cracks, right? Um, Microsoft, every earnings call says they don't have enough capacity to deploy the models as pervasively as they'd like. Uh, OpenAI constantly says they don't have enough capacity to deploy the models they'd like, right? Um, you know, and other other folks as well, right? Uh, Google and Anthropic, they've definitely had issues deploying the models as fast as they'd like to, uh, just due to capacity, right? Um, so as you look you across capacity, the ecosystem- that's, that's GPU data center capacity. Right, exactly. Um, and then and then the flip side is like, hey, like enterprises uh, getting them to adopt AI is taking time, right? It's not a not a flip of the switch um, as it has been with like startups and some of the tech companies. Um, so you know that's that's like the the challenge there. Um, I think I think the crack that we see um, now is really that no one gets to make money besides the person who's their first or second. Right. Everyone else is actually their margins are really bad. Um, you know, when right. we're talking about, hey, serving llama tier models, serving deep seek tier models, that's great, right? Like, yeah, but like meta and deep seek aren't making money from open sourcing it. They're they're they've got other tertiary benefits, of course. Um, but then the people who take these open source models and serve them, you know, plain vanilla, um, aren't making money, right? There because there's such intense competition. Um, and then, you know, you kind of have to have built some value add on top and that value add is more sticky and customer specific. Right. And that's where I think like, there's a lot of cracks is like, how can you do the sticky customer specific stuff without doing the, you know, base model and instruct model stuff, uh, without that, like dominating your cost structure and being really bad. So there's sort of a, a catch 22 there. Right. So, so in a sense, the, you know, the, Andreessen, Mark Andreessen has gone off and said, look, this is a race to the bottom. Uh, and uh, these models are going to get commoditized really, really rapidly. So is the observation that you're making, if you look at some of these people who serve models like Together or Grok, um, they're, they're serving very, very cheaply, which means extremely small margin. But not only that, they're not necessarily serving at the Claude Sonnet or GPT-4 level. Yeah, so so I think the the real challenge here. So like like last year we talked about this for Mistral. We said it was a race to the bottom. Um, like the inference was a race to the bottom, and that everyone was just going to take these models and commoditize them. And anytime there's an open source model that commoditizes everything below that tier, um, and that's that's been the case, right? With the release of three, Llama three point one, four hundred five B, and seventy B, uh, that's that's continued to com commoditize um, a lot of. A lot of language models, right? So when we look at like, hey, look at look at uh, Amazon's new model. Well, it doesn't beat four or five B, and it's 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 just a commodity at that point, right? Like, why, what what am I doing here that's differentiated? And so far, the only two companies that have a good margin on serving are OpenAI and Anthropic, right? And then they're partners who get to serve their models, right? So, you know, OpenAI with Microsoft and Anthropic with uh, Amazon, and now they recently announced the Snowflake thing. Um, so there, there's there's very few folks that get to make money serving, um, and it's really just dominated by that first and second place player. Um, and the question is like, hey, what happens when XAI gets to that first or second place? Does that knock one of them out? Um, but given that they've been spending so much, do they even get there? Uh, does that mean that there's now a first, second, and third? Or do first, second, and third now make less money? Um, and, and and that tale continues on, right? What happens when Meta releases Llama 4? Does that just like wipe out another humongous tier of models? Let's assume that these... XAI's model is actually better than GPT-4 or Claude 3.5. How long would it need to be better than those models for developers to actually switch, right? Because the history of technology markets is that there is no number three, there is no number four, there is no number five. And it was it was true even in, in databases, right? From back in the late 80s, early 90s, um, 
you very, very quickly, you had kind of Oracle and Sybase and, and in, in, uh, in Infomix, I think it was, um, uh, there were, you, you couldn't really think of who four or five were. And the, the, the dominance of the top two was really substantial. And why would this technology market be any, any different? Yeah. So I think, uh, one thing about language models is that they're very replaceable, right? So like, you know, we, we talk about like, Hey, this commoditization is, is bad for some businesses. It is, but guess what? It's, it's driving so much adoption, right? The fact that people can adopt Llama 3.170B uh, without paying anyone a margin is driving the cost down so much, right? And in mm -hmm. fact, in some cases, VCs are subsidizing it with inference providers that they keep funding, right? So, so, and then like clouds as well, right? Like with loss leadership type strategies. So it turns out that like, hey, um, these these models commoditizing are driving adoption faster and faster. It's just there's no one really making money off of it, right? Every time someone open sources a model, any margin that the model makers were making. A lot of it gets wiped away, and then what's what's left there? It's margin that NVIDIA has, right? <laughs> and margin that the yeah. uh, data center folks have, right? Sure. So so it ends up being that you knocked out half of this margin, right? You know, you look at Anthropic and OpenAI's margins, their gross margins are 60, 70 plus percent, right? So it's it's that whole thing just gets wiped away, right? Um, and and for Omini, I bet it's not making a ton of money because it's so small and uh, there's got so much competition from Gemini Flash and Anthropic and Llama and right. you, know, you go down the list. So so if a company like XAI were to, or Google were to come out with, hey, this is definitively right up there. Um, if anything, the only way they're going to get market share is by pricing it a little bit lower. That drives people down, right? That drives the margin maybe from 70% to 60% or 50%. All of that delta is money that's lost, but also like semiconductors, right? Moore's law, every two years, we doubled the number of transistors and have the cost, right? Guess what? Market never shrank. It kept growing. That's the bet. That is the bet, right? That increasing demand, expanding the market, there's a positive elasticity of demand as price falls is the bet that is partly being taken here so that if you ask or ask the question, what does 2025 hold? Does anyone really start making money? Um, it might be the case that we're still not in that stable environment where anyone is really making money. I mean, you can look at many different platforms out there in, in the sort of Bay Area tech community, and they didn't make money for a long time, right? Sure, right. you can point 11 to- 11 like years for Amazon. You, look at, you can look at Airbnb and Uber, or you can go even more intense and say YouTube. How long did it take right. Google to make YouTube a money from YouTube? More than a decade. YouTube was a right. money losing enterprise for more than a decade, right? And it scaled and scaled and scaled. But now it's a very tremendously profitable business for Google. Not like search, but it's still tremendously profitable. Um, and, and same with like Amazon and Twitch, right? And there's so many different platforms that are hugely capital intensive, right? Because there's so much compute or bandwidth or storage required uh, to serve them to millions of users. Uh, but once they get the moat, you know, that's really helped. Now, the, the big issue here, or question here is the switching cost is really low, right? If I want to go from OpenAI's API to, you know, hey, new Llama model on together or new DeepSeek model on together or Fireworks or whatever it is, turns right. out it's, it's like you change it like that. It's that easy. You have to do a little Absolutely. bit of testing and you're good. You're done, right? Like yeah. it's, it's, it's like immediately replaceable. So the question is like, can OpenAI, Anthropic and these other companies build services on top, right? The, the ability to switch off of Microsoft Copilot is is probably zero, right? Now, Copilot hasn't gotten a huge amount of adoption because Microsoft doesn't have the compute to actually deploy it at scale with all the features that they promised. But, right. you know, th th that's something that doesn't have switching cost or has huge switching costs. Whereas like just raw API models, tokenomics, those have low switching cost, And so that always chases, um, you know, reducing cost and 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 switching switching makes easier. And then that therefore driving down margin and cost. You talked about compute constraints, constraints there for Microsoft. So let's talk about compute and semiconductors as a as a starting point here. Um, the we've just seen uh, Amazon announce their own family of chips in the last couple of days. That the the, the, the Tranium uh, chips that upon which they've got the the, the new models running uh, Nova, I think the other models the models are called. Um, what do we think? will happen with uh, with the chip, the semiconductor market next year. There's been a supply chain crunch in a sense, right? People can't order enough of these high-end chips and we've got NVIDIA continuing to push out their, their, their roadmap. What should we expect? Yes, I think, I think we'll see, you know, today we have more than a hundred cloud companies that have started in the, just the last few years, 
right? Last couple of years. Right. Um, some of them pivoted from other things, but all of them are basically new to GPU cloud, right? 